children's meeting uh, this week. It's their fun night, so it will be held over in Meadowbank. And therefore, do remember the children will be home a little bit later on Wednesday night. Also in the hallway, there is the Vision magazine. If you have paid for that, then please do lift this edition of your subscription. And we trust the Lord will bless that to your hearts. We're coming to the Word of God and we're turning to 2 Kings and the chapter number 6, continuing our study in the life of Elisha. And 2 Kings chapter 6, we want to read from verse number 24. And let's hear the Word of the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor? Or out of the winepress? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman saith unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So he boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. It came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and passed by upon the wall. And the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said, God do more or God do so and more unto me. If the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What or why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy precious living eternal word. Lord, we realize we've read the account of events that have taken place some time ago. And Lord, how we sit this morning horrified that such things took place. And yet, Lord, we're not often horrified over our own sin. We're not often broken over the sins of our nation. Even the depths of the depravity of our hearts. And we pray this morning, Lord, that thou wilt teach us from this passage and teach us the principles by which you would have us live. And Lord, lead us and guide us in the right way this morning. May thy word have free course in hearts. May it change our hearts and consequently change our lives. Lord, empty this preacher of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit and give me help to deliver the word of God as thou hast given to me. For the extension of thy kingdom, for the building up of thy children, Lord, speak today. For we are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In verse number 24, it says, and it came to pass after this. And this is a statement, obviously, of chronology. And some time later, after verse number 23, this event took place. Now, how long after verse 23, we don't know. We do know that the Syrians did not come in bands anymore into the land of Israel to try and attack them or to try and hurt them. 
But some time must have passed and the king has forgotten about the kindness shown to them by Israel. And rather than being thankful for the kindness and the mercy that was shown to them by Israel, he turns against Israel. And he seeks to hurt Israel and he seeks to afflict Israel and he seeks to make an attack upon them. You see, while kindness was shown to the Syrians, the Syrians were still the enemies of Israel. We should never be surprised when the enemies of the Lord attack the people of God. Just as the king of Syria sought to hurt the king of Israel by attacking that city of Samaria and by bringing it under siege, so too the devil seeks to hurt God and attack God by hurting his people. And therefore, whenever attacks come against us and those difficulties come against us that we have no control over, and whenever the devil seeks to have a heyday, either in the church or in our lives, first of all, we should not be surprised. It should not take us by surprise. We are in a battle. And if you're saved any length of time, you'll know that there is an enemy. There is a devil. He's real. He's powerful. Thank God he's not all powerful. Only Christ is all powerful. So therefore, don't be surprised whenever he seeks to come. However, don't be unprepared. Don't be unprepared. We should always be on our guard against the enemy. How do we be on our guard? Well, whenever we think of the book of Ephesians, we're told about the armor of faith and those things that we can put on that will protect us from the attacks of the evil one. And we need to be reading the Bible and we need to be praying and we need to be in fellowship with the Lord and then we'll not be unprepared. You know, the Bible is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And therefore, whenever the attacks of the evil one come, we can defeat him and we can have victory by knowing what the Bible says and by applying the Bible to our lives and by obeying its principles. So therefore, don't be surprised, but don't be unprepared. Neither be faithless when uh, the attacks come. You know, sometimes whenever the devil attacks, Uh, People, instead of running to the Lord and finding a refuge in God, they actually run away from God. As if, you know, God has permitted this. It's not fair. So I'm not going any further with the Lord. And that's the wrong attitude. Whatever God permits in our lives, he will give us the help to see it through. And he will give us help to go through those difficult times. He will give us help to stand in the battle. He will give us help and grace to go through all that he has allowed to come into our lives. So dear believer, whatever circumstance you're in this morning, yes, it may be dark. It may be difficult. It may be a prison house experience. Ah, but there's grace and there's help For your very are from the Lord. Remember this, when God's people are attacked, the devil is lashing out against God. We remember in the Garden of Eden, whenever Adam and Eve were attacked by the devil, and he threw temptation upon them, and they succumbed, and they uh, fell in their sin, and in their pride, they went against God and against God's word. What was the devil doing? He was attacking God's children that he made attack the Lord. Remember, whenever the children of Israel went down to Egypt, and then they became slaves in Egypt, and Pharaoh sought to hurt them and bring them into greater bondage and make their life more and more miserable, what was he doing? He was hurting the people of God that he might attack God. We think of Naaman's plan to annihilate the Hebrew people in the book of Esther. What was the devil doing? The devil was using wicked Naaman to hurt the people of God that he might attack God. We think of Herod's plan whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was born into this world and when he realized that the wise men had duped him and he was not going to find where the Christ child was, he made a a decree that all the Hebrew boys under two years old should be killed. What was happening? The devil was using an evil man to hurt God's people. He was attacking God. But I want to tell you today that God is still ruling and reigning over all. He cannot be defeated. He is alive and alive forevermore. 
He is the great victor. He has victory over sin and hell and death and Satan and all of those things. And what a foolish, wicked, unwise thing to try and fight against God. And this battle and this attack against God was to attack his chosen people, the people of Israel. And it says in verse number 25, And there was great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five pieces of silver. Now the siege, of course, resulted in a famine, which resulted in a lack of food. And the people were so reduced in their streets that they ate what would otherwise be considered garbage or waste. That which would be thrown away, that which was worthless, of very little nourishment. They were truly hungry. They were starving for lack of food. There was not enough to go around. And you know what happens whenever there's a lack of food? The prices go through the roof. There were two items highlighted here to show just how bad this famine was. There was the ass's head. The head of any animal, of course, would be in the cheapest part. It certainly wouldn't be the part that people would eat in normal times. In fact, the very meat of a donkey would not have been eaten at all normally by uh, Hebrew people. But to give you an idea of how expensive it was to purchase just the head of the donkey in the time of famine, in ordinary times when food was widely available, a full donkey, an entire donkey, could be bought for half the price that they were charging just for the head in the time of famine. It speaks about dove's dung. Now, there's great debate by Bible commentators over what this was. Some uh, Bible scholars say that it was literal dung. And the people uh, went through it and found the grains that the birds had eaten and hadn't been digested and tried to use that to make food. Uh, Some other Bible commentators say that the word which is translated dove's dung uh, was used to describe a very cheap type of pulse or lentil, which when left in the sun and parched looked like dove's dung, and that's where it got the name. But either way, it was something very coarse. It wasn't appetizing. It wasn't a good meal. It was something that really was uh, the last possible thing that you could think about. A cab is believed to be the smallest dry measure of the Israelite people. And the measure then was divided into quarters. And a quarter cab cost five pieces of silver. That was more than a month's wage for a laboring man. More than a month's wage for dirt that you could hold in your hand. Oh, it's an awful thing to be hungry. It affects your morale, it affects your mind, it affects your body, causes weakness, it drives people to extreme measures to survive. My friend, as we think about that, there's been a famine in our land for a long time of the preaching of the word of God. There are many churches. There are many preachers. But not all bring men and women to the word of God. This is the only authority that we have to preach. This is the only word we have And therefore, we must come to the word of God. And I urge you, don't be having fainting fits. Uh, Don't be having that spiritual weakness and that spiritual lack of strength because you are not feasting on the word of God on a daily basis. You need the strength that God's word gives. You need the milk of the word. You need the meat of the word to be built up in your holy faith, to be strong, to be faithful, to be true unto the Lord. And therefore, don't starve yourselves spiritually. There's very few of us who think of skipping a meal. Oh, dear believer, don't skip the word of God. In verse number 25, and, or sorry, 26, 27, we find uh, the king coming. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? Now, the king of Israel was passing by. He was upon the wall. And he would have been recognized by his clothing and possibly also by the entourage that was accompanying him. 
And we find that in this verse, there was a woman who looked to her king and she cried unto him for help. And that was a natural thing to do because leaders are supposed to help and protect the people that they rule over. That is what leaders are supposed to do, to help and protect the people over whom they rule. But the reaction of the king was heartless toward this lady. Basically, the Lord's not going to help you. Why should I help you? In fact, some Bible commentators say, effectively was saying, let not the Lord help you. Let not the Lord save you. I hope you die. That's how heartless this man was. How can I help you? My barn floor is empty. The wine press is empty. There's great need. There was no way for him to help himself. He certainly couldn't help other people. And this man came to realize his limitation. Oh, he may be the king. He may have been appointed the leader, but there was absolutely nothing that this man could do in his time of need. And I'm so glad that as we come to God's house, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, I do not point you to the leaders of our country for your help. I do not point you to the leaders of our country for your greatest needs. Because there is a king passing through today. And every time God's people gather, this king comes and he walks through the midst of his people, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he meets all of our needs. A friend, he can meet your need today. Here was a woman who cried out in desperation. Absolute desperation. Her life was a mess. She made unwise choices. She committed the grossest of sins. And she called out to the king, hoping for help. Praise God, the sinner can call today to the king who's with us. You can call to the king of kings, the lord of lords, for forgiveness, for cleansing, and for peace. If you're in your sin today, our Savior can save you. He can change you. He's the only one who can help you. He's the only one who can change your life and make you acceptable before God. He's the only one who can save you and make you right for heaven. He's the only one who can take away the guilt and the shame of the past and of your sin. And I say to God's people today, you too can call out to Jesus in your need. What is your need? Do you need encourage today? Do you need strengthened today? Do you need led by the Lord today? Whatever your need is, God can meet you at the point of your need. And on like the King of Israel, our God, our Lord, is not limited in his ability to help. He is able to save. He is able to deliver. He's able to strengthen. He's able to keep his people. He is able to meet your need as you call upon him. Turn just for a moment to Psalm 146 because there was a lovely passage I read this week. And whether this past week, this election has gone the way you wanted it to go or hasn't gone the way you wanted it to go, I'm not interested. I don't want to know. Here's my message for you this morning. It says, verse 3, put not your trust in princes or in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and in that very day his thoughts perish. But happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth and sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth, truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. And here is the message from heaven today to us in this congregation. Don't put your hope and your trust in the rulers of the land. But happy is the man whose trust is in the Lord. What our land needs is not a new government. Our land needs a breath of God to come through it. Our land needs a real awakening. Our churches need to be set on fire. And the ungodly need to have that awareness that only God can give, that there is a God in heaven. And friend, we respect our government. We pray for government. We obey our government according to the word of God. 
but we look to the Lord for the deliverance. My hope is in my God. Verses 28 and 29, we read of how a woman made a pledge with another woman that they were going to take their child and they're going to kill their child and eat their child. I'm sure like me, there was a shiver went down your spine as you read this record of a woman who killed her son for food. And whenever we read through history, we find the extremes that people went to whenever they were in very, very difficult circumstances. Do you know that the Lord prophesied this would happen? If the people didn't obey God? Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's a passage of blessings and cursings. And it says, blessed is a man who obeys, essentially. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commands, which I command thee this day, verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon thee. And then there's a list of blessings that the Lord will bless people who are following him and serving him. Verse 15, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And we go down to verse number 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness, wherein thine enemies shall distress thee. Whenever you go contrary to God's will and to God's way and to God's word, it always ends in disaster. And parents, the choices that you make it will affect your children and your grandchildren and possibly generations who are yet to be born. The choices that you make today, the life that you make today, whether to go through with God or to ignore the word of God, there will be a telling. There will be consequences. A friend, Israel, at this state, was a nation that was full of idolatry. They were full of wickedness. Oh, they had faithful preachers but they had a wicked king. And the people were given over to immorality and they were given over to deceit and they were given over to playing the religious person, but the reality was there wasn't an ounce of faith or obedience within their being. And we stand and we wonder how anyone could kill a child. And then we realize it's happening in our own land today. There's no famine here. People aren't in great straits here. No, it's just an inconvenience. And I'll get rid of it. In August 2019, the members of parliament in New South Wales, in Australia, newspaper, erup uh, newspaper reports that they erupted into cheers as the bill to decriminalize abortion passed its first hurdle after three years of lengthy and passionate debate, they burst into cheer. Applause, jubilance. This is the day we've been waiting for. You can see online the picture of them all standing, smiling, hands in the air. We've done it. Little knowing that they've signed the judgment of God upon their nation unless they repent from such wickedness. Friend, don't think because, just because there's no famine in Northern Ireland. Don't think just because God has withheld his wrath in Northern Ireland that our morals and standards are any better than those of Samaria. They're not. People stood this past week on the ticket that they are open 
to support immorality and abortion, all of these things. And the country has said, that's what we want. That's what we want. We need to be on our knees praying. We need to be on our knees repenting. And we need to be on our knees seeking the mercy of God. What did the king do in verse 30? He tore his clothes. That's an act of grief and sorrow in those days to tear your clothes. And we see that under his clothes, and we assume it was his kingly robes, under his clothes there was sackcloth upon his body. Now that again was a symbol of mourning and repentance. And he was wearing that below his clothes. It was uncomfortable, it was itchy, but that was the idea to make you uncomfortable as you were going about to, uh, as it were, repent and to show mourning and to show grief over what was happening. And it says in this verse, verse 30, that the people looked and he had sackcloth within his flesh. You see, as the people looked to the king that day, it appeared that he was pleading to the Lord for his land and for his people. He was wearing their clothes of repentance. But man looks in the outward appearance and the Lord looks upon the heart. You know what Joel says in chapter 2.13? Rend your hearts and not your garments. You can't fool God by playing the part. You can't fool God by dressing up as a repentant person whenever your heart is not right with him. And I'm telling you this morning, it is useless to do religious things if your heart is not right. It is useless for you to pray with unclean hands and, or with unclean hands and with an unclean heart. You may as well speak to that wall. You cannot come into the presence of God and plead for a land when you yourself are in sin. And therefore, the Lord doesn't desire an outward show that others think you are something. The Lord desires that your heart would be right, that there would be true confession, that there would be true repentance. Now, this man was in a very difficult situation, a very difficult situation. And he turned to religious activities, hoping that this would help. Many people do that. Many people do that. No interest in the things of God. No time for the church or the preacher or the Christian. Ah, when something's wrong, who's the first person they call? Start coming to church. Friend, it's not your attendance, it's your heart. It's not your actions, it's your heart. And God revealed this man's heart. Oh, it looked as if he was seeking God and repenting for the sins of his nation. But God revealed this man's heart through his lips. And if you want to know a man's heart, you listen carefully to what they say. Because what's in the heart will come out in the lips as well as in the life. And the Lord revealed the king of Israel's heart. And look what he says. Verse 31. God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. Now God was judging this city. There's no doubt about that. And God was dealing with this man, showing him his weakness and his limitation. There's no doubt about that. And what does he do? He blames the servant of God for his problem. He's angry with Elisha. But in reality, he's angry with God. Because all Elisha did was bring the message of God and the word of God. Friend, he even blasphemes. God do so and more to me. He didn't know God. This wicked man comes before God and invokes the name of God as he curses the man of God. He's not angry over his own sin. He's not angry or grieved over the sins of his nation, but he lays the blame at the feet of of the people of God and their people doing that in our land today. Have you ever heard anybody say the problem with this country is the religious people, the Christians, they interfere, they bother us with their nonsense, we don't want them, we don't need them. That's the attitude today of a lot of people. Let's blame the Christian. Let's blame the Bible. Let's blame the churches. Let's blame the Lord. And of course, in doing that, they lift themselves and elevate themselves up to be the most wonderful people because they don't cause any problems. 
But friend, there's no grievance over their sin. You know what we need in this land? We need the Lord to deal with the pride of people, including the believers. But certainly against those who will stand up as elected representatives and say, we don't need God. We don't need God. We bring to a conclusion quickly. This vow is made. I'm going to take the head of this man today. And what's Elisha doing? Well, verse 32, Elisha sat in his house. And the elders sat with him, and the king sent the man from before him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See how the son of a murderer hath taken or sent to take away mine head. And look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. It's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. We notice Elisha's company. He was with the elders, godly people who encouraged him in spiritual things. Friend, in the day of battle, the day that we're living in, get godly friends around you. Get godly people around you to encourage your soul. Notice the revelation that he had. God gave him a foreknowledge of the attack that was coming. And notice the battle plan. He was to give no place to the enemy. He wasn't even to open the door to him. But he was to gather together with people of like-minded faith. And he was to stand against the enemy. What great advice for you and me this morning. First of all, your company. Keep company with the people of God. Secondly, the revelation. Read the word of God and you'll understand the attacks that come from the devil. You'll understand about temptation, about slander, about discouragement, about hurt, about disappointment. If you've suffered it, it's in the book. And God tells you how to deal with it. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised for arm ourselves through the revelation of the word of God. But notice the battle plan. They were to give no place to the enemy. The minute he whispers in your ear, you throw the word of God at him. The minute the doubts and the discouragements come, go to the word of God and remind yourself how faithful your God is. The minute temptation comes, go to the word of God and remind yourself that you'll be blessed if you obey. When slander comes, go to the word of God and be reminded that God will stop the mouths of the wicked and that God will put right those things that have been said against you. When hurt and disappointment comes, go with your Lord. And go with him as he's rejected and forsaken of men. Mocked and ridiculed and realize that the hurt and disappointment you're going through has also been experienced by your Savior on a much greater plane. And he's able to sympathize with you and to bring you through and encourage your heart. And then fight against the enemy. Give him no place. Work together with the people of God. Be a part of the work of God. Be a part of the prayer meeting. Be a part of those who are laboring. Be a worker in the church of Jesus Christ. And then be aware of this. Look at the end of verse 32. It's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. Behind every attack is the enemy king. And finally, the final verse and with this we're through. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him. And he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. Why? The word really means why. Should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, again, Bible commentators are divided whether this is the messenger speaking or if the king has now arrived. And it's the king speaking or is it the messenger speaking on behalf of the king. But he is essentially saying, I know that this famine is from the Lord. He is then saying, why should I wait on the Lord any longer? Why should I just not kill Elisha and surrender to the enemy and take whatever is coming? And here we see the difference between the ungodly and the Christian in response to difficult circumstances. God has hurt me, so I'll just do more sinful things. That's the attitude of this man. This hardship was an opportunity for this king to repent and to follow God, to lead his nation, as it were, his family, back into blessing. God was not lacking in his part. As we, can see, as we will see in a couple of weeks' time, God was able to turn this situation around in a day. And he did. Ah, but the king wasn't interested in God's help. He refused to obey God. He blamed God for the outcome. And perhaps there's someone here today and you need to stop fighting with God. 
And you need to stop blaming God and acknowledge that the mess in your life is of your own making because you've gone your own way. You see, had this messenger looked at Elisha and seen the peace he had even in the midst of the famine, even in the midst of difficulty, Maybe he would have learned something of what it is to have peace in the midst of the storm. But he said, why should I wait on God any longer? You know what he's saying? God's no use to me. And dear friend, if you're not saved, if that's what you've been saying all your life, God's of no use to me. He's not worthy of my love, of my repentance, of my obedience, of what I ought to be. No, 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 God's of no use to me. He's your only hope, your only answer, the only one who can help you today. I praise God he's ready and he's willing. Don't wait any longer. Don't keep the Lord waiting any longer this morning, but come to Christ. And know the joy of sins forgiven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the study and the word this morning. We realize there's been so much we've covered and oh Lord we just pray what has been of thee will uh, live on and prosper in hearts and what has been of man will fall to the ground and perish. We do thank thee and we praise thee that we have a God who cannot be defeated. We have a salvation that cannot be taken away and we have peace in the midst of life storms. We're not depending upon what happens in the world for our peace and our joy. But we're rejoicing and resting in the finished work of Christ. Oh Lord, give us joy in our hearts today. Help us to live as the winners, those who are on the victor's side. Because thou canst not fail. Oh Lord, turn our land again. We need thee, Lord. We often wonder how far can we go and then we go further Lord stop the marches of sin and save a generation for thy glory these things we pray in Jesus precious name Amen and Amen our closing hymn this morning is 569 569 O safe to the rock that is higher than I my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. Once again, if you're uh, able to stay with us for time of communion, then please do that this morning. And if you're not, then you're welcome to leave during the singing of this hymn.